Yeah, I think we're good. Thanks, Scott. Yep. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the National Constitution Center and happy Juneteenth. We are so excited to have you all here today to celebrate the nation's second Independence Day. Uh, I'm very excited for this next program. We have our Kids Town Hall featuring two wonderful freedom fighters. We have Henry Box Brown joining us and also uh, Bishop Richard Allen. We're gonna share a little bit about their stories, um, you know, their, their thoughts on Juneteenth, emancipation and the fight for freedom and equality for all. Uh, if you have questions throughout the program, I'm going to do my best to filter those questions to our moderator, uh, who is going to be kind of facilitating this conversation between these two freedom fighters. Um, but please feel free to test out in the chat. Uh, if you have questions right off the bat, feel free, let us know. Um, but also let us know where you're tuning in from, who you are tuning in with. Uh, we are so excited to have you here. We've got a couple minutes until go time. And then we're going to go ahead and get started. I see that we've got Maryland well represented here. Hello, Maryland. Super excited to have you back. And I think we've got Philly and New Jersey too. Uh, if you are in, if you are around the area in Philadelphia, we do have free admission at the Constitution Center today, courtesy of Citizens. Um, very exciting uh, program lineup happening at the museum and, of course, online, too. Uh, very excited to have you all here. I see my colleague Brian, who is on stage, probably getting ready to bring out our Freedom Fighters, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, very excited to have you all here. This is a wonderful program uh, that I'm excited for us to begin. Here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us here today at the National Constitution Center on this Juneteenth holiday. We're pleased to have you uh, join us for a day full of programming helped by our friends from Citizens Bank. And as we are ready to begin this portion of our day, our town hall with a couple of historic figures, a uh, well-known uh, I'll say abolitionists. I think that's fair to say, gentlemen, if we would use that term. Uh, I, our friends are Bishop Richard Allen and Henry Box Brown. Uh, when I ask, just checking with our friends in the audience, are we familiar? Has anyone heard of any of these fellows? Ooh, I guess we'll have a lot to learn, gentlemen. I hope you're not too worried about uh, speaking at length about yourselves. If we're feeling confident to do so, uh, I understand at least one of you is very accustomed to doing so. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we are, of course, gathered here on Juneteenth. Uh, June 19th is the anniversary of June 19th, 1865. General Gordon Granger, uh, the General Order Number 3. Uh, and that would be essentially announcing to uh, the people of Galveston, Texas, uh, that the Emancipation Proclamation was in effect, that they and any people within the state of Texas who were enslaved would be then and forever free. Uh, it's seen as really the, uh, it's celebrated today as essentially the end of slavery in America. It's not the precise end, but the, uh, the really the step of the Emancipation Proclamation after two and a half years from when it was signed to when it takes effect throughout all of the Confederacy. I suppose I could ask you gentlemen, and first uh, if you'd want to introduce yourselves, and then I have a question based on that point. But um, uh, Bishop Allen, would you like to first? Yes, uh, my name is Bishop Richard Allen, and I happen to be the founder of the first independent African church denomination in America. They're called AME churches, African Methodist Episcopal and started right here in the year 1816 to give African Americans a better place where they knew they could go and worship in peace and, and with some dignity. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, well, and, the honor, and, and, uh, Bishop. and you, Mr. Brown. Uh, my name is Henry Box Brown. I am uh, didn't start a church like the bishop did, but I am a ex-slave. 
Uh, and in 1815, uh, that's when I was born, but around 1849, I actually mailed myself from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia to escape slavery. And I spent 27 hours in the box and I made myself here, uh, not too far from, actually on the fifth and arch where I met a gentleman by the name of William Still. And uh, he released me from my box and uh, I'm here to just to share uh, my story. I am very familiar with Juneteenth. Uh, mm. And so I am really looking forward oh. to sharing some, uh, some of the, uh, things that I experienced mm -hmm. uh, through slavery and the importance of what this day actually means to me. Wonderful. I think that is a good point because that is exactly what I had wanted to ask. Um, and I feel pardon me with that, uh, Bishop Allen. Uh, Mr. Brown, what of this holiday or of what it marks? Like, what do you remember of that? Or how did you experience observations of that in your, your lifetime? Well, uh, to be honest with you, when I decided to return to the United States after the war. Uh, so everyone would know that when I came here in 1849, when I escaped in 1849, in 1850, there was the Fugitive Slave Act that was passed. And I had to escape again mm. because the Fugitive Slave Act allowed slave catchers to go as far as the Canadian border to retrieve runaways. And I was living in Boston at the time. And uh, of course my poster was plastered all over the place and everyone knew about what I had done. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did escape yeah. to uh, Manchester, England and I stayed there until after the civil war. And I made myself, I, I brought my new family back to the United States. So when we came back, it was just prior to the Juneteenth celebration when the, uh, the slaves in Gaveston were set free. So for me, it was a, um, a moving experience to recognize the fact that we were all now free. And, and it is so important as a people and as a nation that we understand what that actually means. And uh, so now I, I, I'm still, I have a book out, but I'm still walking around telling people the importance of what freedom is and uh, how we can continue to obtain that even in the struggle, even in the struggle, even though on paper we're free, but technically we need to be free in the mind as well. It's really incredible to think to live through such a transformative time like that and those experiences mm -hmm. too. Uh, Bishop Allen, I did want to ask you that while you may not uh, be familiar with, uh, honestly, the if I threw out terms like the Emancipation Proclamation or abolition, uh, in your own time period, you would also have, like uh, Mr. Like Henry Brown, have experienced uh, enslavement. But you would have also lived through a period of transformation, at least here in Pennsylvania, uh, right, about the institution of slavery and whose lives it touched. Um, are you able to, to share maybe your experiences in that time yes, or as uh, this state challenge takes it on? I, I should mention that I was born enslaved in the year 1760. And my owner uh, happened to be a pretty prominent Philadelphian here, a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Chu who was, uh, was at one time Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Hmm. And when I was seven years old, he decided to just sell my whole family to a plantation owner in Delaware. And um, when I'm 17, I'm very depressed. Uh, but this is where my life took a drastic spiritual turn because Methodist preachers, came to that plantation and they got permission from my owner, he's not even a believer, for me to hear the gospel message. And it changed my life. Because when I heard that gospel message, I began to understand that it didn't matter whether you are rich or poor, it doesn't matter whether you're free or enslaved, and it doesn't matter the color of your skin. From what I heard, everyone had to stand in front of that judgment seat of Christ. And I decided that my biggest problem wasn't that I was a slave to men, I was a slave to sin. I was a slave to breaking the laws of God. So I decided to take Christ as my savior. And the second that I did, 
I was free. I happened to be still enslaved at that time, but really I was free. I held prayer meetings in my owner's kitchen. He became a believer and eventually he agreed to allow me to go out and work, earn money so I could give him $2,000. And it took me three and a half years to do that, but I was able to accomplish that. Now, when I established my church in 1794, the basement of my church was a station for the Underground Railroad. And you see, that was against the law. You see, because in 1793, George Washington signed into law right here something called the Fugitive Slave Act, which made it illegal to help any escape enslaved person. That's the law of man. But for me, I decided to follow the law of God, which said, no, that is not correct. You should help those that are enslaved get their freedom. And that's what I did. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. I wanted to uh, then ask, uh, sort of in the immediate aftermath for each of you, so we were able to both find faith and secure your freedom. And you were able to, wow, a really remarkable story. Um, I mean, I'd say we should read all about it if you folks haven't, but we could also uh, hear from the man himself. Uh, would you, uh, to talk about that and then delve into what were your experiences of freedom immediately afterwards of, of that legal emancipation? Or in your case, I guess it was not, huh? Uh, could you share how exactly did you go about Mailing yourself, because uh, well, it's probably easier said than done. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. Uh, well, just to uh, bring a, uh, just to bring it down to a, a short period of time, uh, and in in ex exclaiming, explaining how I was able to do what I did. Um, when I married, I had an opportunity to raise my family in a home that I was able to provide. And this all came from my wife's master who was, uh, he was trying to purchase my wife to his wife, but he didn't have all the money. And so he decided to come to me because I was able to, I, I was able to make money being a, even though I was a slave, but I was working on a plantation where my uh, owner was paying me for the work that I did. And uh, so Master Control comes to me and he says, you know, Henry, if you're able to pay me the $50 I need so that I can purchase your wife and the children, I promise as a Christian gentleman that I will not sell the family. And he says, if you're able to provide a home for them and you provide all of the amenities that they need uh, so that I don't have to pay for it, I will allow them to stay with you and, uh, and then you can raise them. And I did that. Hmm. I was able to do that for 10 years. Unfortunately, the problem was that the other slave owners in the area were very upset with Master Cottrell and to the point that they really made fun of him. Mm -hmm. And so it made it uncomfortable for him to remain a owner a prominent owner. So he decided that the only way I could, he could save face was to come to me and ask me for a ridiculous amount of money, which I didn't have. Mm. And once I was not able to pay him by law, I broke our promise or the agreement that we had set. And so he had every right to do what he wanted. So what he did was when I went to work, he came in and took my wife and the children. Once he took them, I was no longer able to um, raise the money that I needed in order to keep us all together. Once I lost that, there was no reason for me to remain in Virginia any longer. So I prayed and I asked God, how am I going to do, how am I, what am I going to do with my life? And God gave me the idea uh, I was reading the Bible one day and I was reading the story of Moses. Oh. And I just happened to go across the whole exit of what took place with Moses. Yeah. And that's when I saw his mother, you know, put him in the basket mm. sitting down the river. I was like, the Lord said, that's how you're going to escape. You're going to nail yourself from this part of, from the South to the North. 27 hours I spent 
but that was my way of getting away from my oppressor. And um, so now that I am free, now I'm trying to figure out how do I continue sharing not only my story, but actually how do I uh, get people to understand the importance of freedom or the, the abomination of slavery? Because even though we were enslaved, I, my mother and both of my parents were very strong Christians mm -hmm. and they embedded in us that our master was not God as we were thought, when we were taught, mm -hmm. but that, that God is supreme mm -hmm. and he looks down on us and he gives us the strength to overcome. So once yes. they rec I recognized who God was and who I am, I was like, yes, my calling is to make sure that the story gets out. Not only my story, but that my story gets out that we can help others to escape or others to understand freedom within their mind, not the chains, but freedom in their mind. And that's what's important. That's basically what the bishop was saying. Same thing. And I know you spoke to many, and eventually you yourself, you mentioned, had to leave the country. Now, it's my understanding, and you've mentioned as a stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, Bishop Allen, yes. uh, after folks would pass through your, uh, your congregation or through you and your community, uh, what, was, what was the idea of what would happen next? How would you and others here in Philadelphia help those seeking freedom uh, continue well, to secure it? Yes, um, that, that was very important because, again, scripturally, uh, you are not to return uh, an enslaved person back to their owner. You're to help them to be free. So uh, in my church, when I established my church in 1794, one of the first things I did was look at education. Mm -hmm. You see, because it became very clear to me, freedom is one thing equality is totally different. And I felt that equality was a much greater challenge than freedom. Because when I came to Philadelphia in 1786, boy, there's over a thousand African-Americans that are in Philadelphia that are free, but they don't have equality. Mm. You see, I'm here when the constitution is written. And I'm here when the new government is formed. And I'm here when the laws are being passed. And one of the laws that I saw passed in 1790 was something called the Naturalization Act. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, hmm. but it basically defines who can be a citizen. And the primary criteria was white skin. Mm. And I'm here in 1792 when they passed the Militia Act, which said, oh, you want to serve in the military? You have to be white. And you see, I saw that as a great challenge because as a business person, and as there are many free Africans here, we have businesses, we must pay taxes but we have no representation. Hmm. And I know that's the whole thing that motivated the revolution from England. Mm -hmm. Taxation without no say in the laws. And that's what we found ourselves in too. So, but we free Africans didn't say, hey, we're gonna pick up guns and we're gonna revolt against this country. No, we tried to explore other methods. For example, in 1799, 72 free Africans here submitted a petition to Congress for equality, for an end of slavery. And I'm sad to tell you in 1800, that petition came before Congress and it was defeated by a vote of 84 to one. And we had even heard, some have said, well, we the people doesn't include them. So I don't think you'd be surprised that we started looking at alternatives to remaining in this country. We very seriously considered going to Sierra Leone. We very seriously considered going to Haiti. We very seriously considered to go to Canada because we couldn't vote in this country, but if we went to Canada, we could become citizens. So 
our focus was more than freedom. It was equality and finding how we could make a better life for ourselves by making some choices. Wonderful. And those, those choices and those actions will help all people, not just yes, your community. Absolutely. Now, what I wanted to do, because we mentioned this as a town hall, is if any of our friends in the audience, if any of us happen to have questions for uh, Bishop Allen and for Mr. Brown, we would love to hear from you. I know I could ask questions to these two fellows all day, but I hope I might hear from some of our friends in the audience. Does anyone else have anything on their mind they want to ask, perhaps? Uh, if you don't mind, Ooh. oh I yeah, would like of course. To say something. Uh, I, uh, I actually, uh, uh, Bishop, I was out a little earlier today, mm -hmm. and I met some friends, mm. and um, and they are actually sitting right there in the front row. Oh hi, yeah, <laughs> hi Parker. Oh, <laughs> and oh, I man. told them that I was going to be here today. I was going to be up here, and they kind of modified their little uh, vacation. And uh, the, my little brother, my little friend down there, wanted to hang out with me today. So oh. I am so honored that they were able to do that. Say, hey, Park, how you doing? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, thank well, you, well, my oh, great friend. Great. <laughs> so, I've been with him. He actually helped me raise the flag today. So, oh, yeah. oh. so I am so I am so oh. grateful that his family uh, took the time out and. And to come out with and oh and i have another friend out there today oh hello journey hi, hi. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> i met journey and her mom a little earlier uh while we were downstairs so uh wonderful. i was very grateful that they decided to come up and and spend this time with oh us. wonderful so, uh, very glad that they were able to come and hang out with us today thank you all for joining us that's fantastic um <laughs> now, since you got to speak earlier, you got a little sneak preview of a conversation with Henry Box Brown. Uh, but do any of our friends have questions for these fellows? Uh, otherwise, I can certainly think of a few that I could ask the general. Oh, oh, Parker, you have oh, a question? This... What would you like to ask? Where's your family? Where's my uh, family? Well, my first family uh, were actually uh, sold to a gentleman who was a Methodist minister mm -hmm. uh, to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And my first family was, uh, and my wife's name was Nancy. My, I have three children. Uh, there is Henry, Matthew, and Rose. And uh, those, those uh, that my first family there in North Carolina. My current family, we are now living in Ontario, Canada. Mm. Ah, yes, because, and, I'll be a bit of a constitutional bit to share is there is a provision in the constitution and then there's a law that says that someone could be returned to people who are held to service or labor. Mm -hmm. And so this was a challenge you felt, especially because you became very famous. Very and famous. Becoming someone who is very famous for having escaped slavery means that you could be more easily recognized and perhaps captured. Huh? Correct. Yes. Can I share That's something now? <laughs> I had been a free man in mm. Philadelphia for 22 years. Mm. I was a well-known figure here. I had a church. But would you believe it? Someone came from the South and falsely accused me of being a recently escaped slave. Mm. They actually went and got an arrest warrant for me. And they came to my house with an arrest warrant that I was a recently escaped enslaved person. But the constable that came was ashamed because he knew me. And he told me, go down to the alderman's office and straighten this out. And I did. But now I'm mad. I'm mad because I came this close mm -hmm. to being dragged through the streets of Philadelphia like I was a common criminal and imprisoned. So you know what I did? I filed a civil suit mm -hmm. against the one who had made the false claim against me. How many of you think I won? You're correct. Oh, correct. I won. It was a $600 judgment. Oh, wow. And the person who made the false claim didn't have $600. Do you know what they do with people who can't pay their debts? Hmm. You're going to prison. Wow. 
And guess what? I let him stay there a couple of months just to teach him a lesson. <laughs> but that's I think, that's good for you, yeah. my friend. But that's a, a great step, and also for you to have done that to really discourage this because you were saved somewhat by being such a recognizable member of your community that people knew you were a free man. But Before. someone else who is less known, uh, a lay person, uh, or someone who was not recently escaped but was maybe new to the neighborhood or the community they could have ended up being arrested and captured and kidnapped and sold very much so that was a great step to do to to discourage people from doing trying that with others i thought i saw a couple of hands up over here is that right go ahead our friend in the blue sort of like yeah what did you eat when you were in the box nothing no. <laughs> absolutely nothing uh and the reason being is uh well, actually when i was in the box i only had a pouch of water and the water was to keep me hydrated so i wouldn't pass out a uh, food would have caused me to do you know mm -mm. Mm -mm. and i uh, definitely didn't want to do that while i was in the box <laughs> <laughs> makes, that makes sense. <laughs> so, so everyone would know. Um, basically, because I was a Christian, when I knew that I was going to escape, I fasted uh, twelve hours before I took before I decided to get in the box, so that there was nothing in my system. And then I just water. I just just had enough water to keep, like I said, just to keep me hydrated, to keep me alive. Okay. Incredible. Yes. Oh, yeah. Where's the what? place you went and what did you do? When well, you when I out? got out the box, the first thing I did was I popped out my head and I said, how do you do? I am <laughs> not going to sing the song that I sang. I, <laughs> I actually uh, wrote a song while I was in the box. I wrote this song and it's the 40th song. Mm. Uh, and I actually when I popped out the box that's the very first thing I did I said how do you do and I sang that song and because I was so grateful that God had inclined and he mm. heard my plea for freedom and he actually granted for me took my feet out of the Mari clay mm. put me on that's a rough. strong solid rock and um, I'm just giving you bits and pieces of the song I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole thing because it's at least 30 verses long but uh mm -hmm. it's a long song but I, that's what I did and uh, then I was able to I uh, stayed just a, a couple weeks here in Philadelphia and then I made my way to Boston because when Boston heard that I had found freedom they were dying for mm -hmm. me to come up there and to speak and share my story with them I, I want to mention uh, we're talking about uh, singing Mm -hmm. I happen to have written the first African American hymnal of oh, really? church. Oh. oh yes, and I wrote some songs in there. But you know, I had some of the old favorites well, in there too. Silent Night, and we <laughs> had a lot of those. What a friend we have in Jesus, and what? and I had those. Uh, well, songs Bishop, that now that's quite interesting because I was wondering uh, if possibly uh, your hymnal might have made it down to uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. because uh, even though now I was born in 1815, so uh, I was a singer, I was on the choir, so I might we might have sang I some of the songs so. at the hymnal. I'm gonna have to do. Oh, I'm gonna have to yeah, see. look that into was, that. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, that's so very <laughs> All right. So now I guess we now yeah. We're, so we're connected. Right, right. But I think you probably sing better than me. I well, think. now, Reverend. <laughs> I guess there's only one way to find out. No, no. <laughs> the dogs will be barking everywhere within a hundred miles. Um, no, I suppose I have a question I could think of, but do any of our other friends? I know we had a, a few other hands up. If anybody else had anything they wanted to ask, uh, otherwise, I suppose um, one uh, is is Bishop Allen in your. I'll say in later years, there's a there's a convention you had planned, and, that, and oh, this yes. is something that you would have been a a, a young, probably, I'd say, oh gosh, a teenager, I believe, when this takes place or when yes. this this is planned. I kind of wonder how widespread the news would be, or if this would be familiar to you. But could you tell folks about that? Yeah, I I, I can tell you, I did hold the first African American convention at my church in the year 1830. 
And it was a very serious time for us to come together. You see, because in 1829, we had gotten news in Philadelphia about what had happened in Cincinnati. You see, in Cincinnati, there was a thriving African-American community with homes and businesses. But very unfortunately, a white mob attacked them and burnt down houses and destroyed businesses. So when I addressed that convention, I suggested, and see many of them that had had to flee and they went to Canada to settle for their lives. So that when I addressed that convention, I did suggest that maybe we ought to take a harder look at Canada. I did support people who wanted to maybe leave this country and go somewhere else, because in this country, in 1830, we don't have the right to vote. <laughs> we are not citizens. And like I said, it's, it's not a very comfortable feeling to be taxed and to have to obey laws that you have absolutely no say in. But I would say most of the African-Americans did not look to leave this country. And really there are two reasons for that. Number one reason was that our ancestors helped to make this country what it was. And we had some entitlement, some right to benefit from what this country became. And the second reason was that, yes, uh, we're free, but can we really leave the enslaved behind? Mm. We couldn't. Just because you were free in Philadelphia doesn't mean your family was all of your family, your friends. So we felt that we better, the majority opinion was, well, let's see what we can do to work with this country to get freedom for those that are enslaved. And why shouldn't we benefit from the blood, sweat, and tears that our ancestors spilled here? I think that makes sense. I mean, you'd mentioned as early as the, the 1790s earlier. You'd, you felt yourself and others to be citizens, to be part of that we the people. And uh, just because in, in the 1792, the government said you could not be a citizen, did not mean it would be that way forever. Right. And if you stayed, you would help to make sure that that would change. Yeah. And, and there were there were there's some people that I hope will not be forgotten in history. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is a gentleman by the name of Isaac Hopper. Isaac Hopper is the first person that I saw that put together an underground uh, railroad network. And that happened in 1787. Wow. He helped to organize the very beginnings of what became the under. He's a Quaker. Hmm. He was only 16. But I think that's an important thing to know. It doesn't matter your age and it doesn't matter a lot of things. It's important for us all to stand up and speak and do what is right, regardless of what else is happening in the country. Now, I realize we are probably getting near out of time, but I see at least one hand up and I wanna make sure we get that question. Uh, what have you had to ask? Oh, how many years? So Isaac Hopper, you said, was the first person you knew put together a sort of underground railroad. How long, for how many years do you know he would have uh, participated? Oh, and I guess he, I'll ask as well for you. Is to, yeah, uh, he was a, uh, a leader question. in that, and he did that for many years. Not only was he a coordinator of underground railroad activities in Philadelphia, in addition to that, he was not a lawyer. But when African, Ameri African Americans were falsely accused of being, he's the one that helped me win that case. No. Oh. And he's the one that would come to the defense of those 
who were falsely accused of being escaped slaves. And in fact, there is a very famous case that he helped to win where, you know, the Fugitive Slave Law, you know, Slave Act says, no, you don't help. But he actually, in the courtroom, pulled out the Bible and read it to a gentleman by the name of Jacob Rush, who happens to be the brother of Dr. Benjamin Rush. And he read that scripture because Jacob Rush has says he will never support a law that goes against divine law. But when Isaac Hopper read the scripture, the judge ruled that the man who had been caught we should be now free. Mm -hmm. and he wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question in the front row? I thought we had one more hand up, but I wasn't sure if that was the, <laughs> if your friend had another question. Yes. What do you got, my friend? We're gonna, oh, we're going to have a surrogate ask a question for us. <laughs> I understand. Oh. oh, this is a great question. So there are many other famous abolitionists or folks who make their way to slavery or make their way from slavery. You asked if they ever met Harriet Tubman, either of you gentlemen. No. No, I would no. know who that uh, was. I don't know who that is. Yeah. No. I was like, because it's it's very interesting, because that's a very great question. There are so many people because both she, if you've never met her, because she would have also about two years before you, I believe, made her way also to William Stills home. And if she came before me, she probably settled here, but I was. Yeah, we never cross paths. Yeah, but we that, never cross paths. That's actually one, if you mind me asking one more question. How did you know to arrive at William Still's home? Was, was that where, did you put deliver to William Still? For actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. believe it or not, yeah, actually I did. And that was because uh, the gentleman who uh, helped me um, escape actually had, uh, he knew someone who actually worked in the office with William Still. And we sent them a letter and let them know, let them know what we were doing. And we wanted to make sure that uh, they would receive the box. Mm -hmm. And once we got a correspondence that we that they would receive the box, then the box was actually addressed to William Steele's office. And um, uh, mm -hmm. there's an interesting story is that uh, when William came to inquire about the box, he actually went to the docks looking for the box and um, and he finds the box, but they wouldn't deliver the box, even though the instructions on the box said that they had to deliver it immediately. But they decided the box was too heavy and it was too late in, and they, late in the day. And they decided if you want the box, we had to go get it delivered yourself. So William had to go find a horse and a buggy to come and get me and <laughs> Take me down to his office Whoa. so that I could be <laughs> released. It feels like a timeless experience for some folks, too. Uh, well, thank you so much for both joining us. Thank you, all our members of our audience as well. I hope we learned a bit of uh, new information. Will you two gentlemen be around for a bit? Oh, if yeah, our friends have any questions, yes. I want to thank sure. everyone joining for us sure. online as well for any folks watching. Thank you, everybody. Happy Juneteenth and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your summer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All yeah. right, everyone. I, water. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed um, that town hall with uh, the Reverend, or I'm sorry, the Bishop Richard Allen uh, and Henry Box Brown. Um, you can find more about their stories online at the National Constitution Center's website under our Juneteenth resources. Uh, and we hope that you all had a wonderful time celebrating Juneteenth with us during this program. Uh, we have another program starting in about 20 minutes. Um, we're going to run another history of Juneteenth, the Juneteenth and the Constitution. Uh, so learn a little bit about the holiday, the events of June 19th, 1865, uh, and learn more about uh, the nation and how it, how it celebrates our second Independence Day. Uh, so tune in, check the email, check, check your inbox for an email from me, um, and I'll make sure that uh, I see you again in about 20 minutes.